Hey everyone, I just wanted to show you this quick game that I made with Dragon Ruby using the built-in assets. The only things that were custom were the sound effects, which I got from soundsresource.com. As you can see, I'm, building the, I'm using the built-in resources. This has been so much fun getting this first game to work. I'm really excited to build more games. But as you can see, I have the dragon flying and I can actually change the direction that he's moving. And that will determine where the fireballs are getting shot at. And the whole goal is really just to kill the monsters and to not get hit. Because if you get hit, then you lose hearts. And you only have three hearts available. It's a pretty simple game, but it's just been fun to build. Oh, shoot. See, I accidentally ran into him after I blew him up. And that still causes damage. I might want to fix that. But I guess it makes sense since you're running into like an explosion that would probably hurt you. Also, you can see there's a max distance on the bolts that I'm shooting because I only let those shoot out for 15 frames. And if it hits it during those 15 frames, then boom, and I hit. It's pretty simple. It's a fun game. And obviously, if I lose all my hearts, game over. Hello everybody, in this video I'm going to show you how simple it is to create your own video game using the Dragon Ruby framework. So Dragon Ruby is a framework and a game engine built for Ruby and it allows you to develop native games. So games that can be run as an executable or you can bundle it and then you can put it out on all platforms like even Steam and native mobile devices like iOS and Android. So Dragon Ruby is a really cool platform and if you haven't heard of it I suggest you to go check it out. Now one thing is you do need a license to get started. So if you look at it there's a one-time charge of $48 but there's also income assistance. Now don't abuse this obviously. If you can afford to pay for the development pack then I would advise you to do it because all of this this whole uh, Dragon Ruby language was built by I think just one developer and it's pretty insane how much that they got done they built this whole tool well, maybe maybe it wasn't only one developer but I know the creator personally so he gave me a copy of Dragon Ruby so I can make educational content about it and already I'm just blown away by how awesome it is it has really good documentation like everything that you need is here, everything that you'd want to do. Yeah, so that's what we're going to do in this video. We're going to create a game. I don't know what game it is. We're going to figure that out together. We're going to build something really special. All right, so the first thing that we need is an asset pack for our game. So this is going to be all of the graphics that we're going to put inside of the game. And then we can have our code move the different objects around and position things. So that's what we're going to be doing. So for me, I just looked up free game assets online and I found itch.io, which is actually a platform for hosting indie games. And this is where a lot of the Dragon Ruby games are also. So if you look up Dragon Ruby itch.io, there's a whole section for games that were built with Dragon Ruby. This is interesting. Wait, it's actually, guys, it's actually on sale 100% off. Uh, so maybe it is free right now. Go check that out. I don't know if you guys have that same coupon deal But you might be able to get this for free on itch.io But then if you want to go to indie, it's kind of funny Because the standard features there's a lot like web builds raspberry pi in-game web server That's crazy. Like there's so much that's It just seems like this is already all you'd need but then there's indie features like uh, easier Steam distribution, so they make it faster for you. C extensions, so if you need to write custom C extensions, which is kind of crazy. Pro features means they'll help you distribute to iOS and Android, and you get HD mode. I don't get why we don't already have HD mode. That's kind of crazy. And you also get Oculus Quest. Hello world is one file, three lines. This is all you needed to create a game. And then render label.
Oh, they rendered it as an array because that's a little bit faster than rendering as a object. I like this. So they kind of summarize it all into six things. Here's the six primitives that you can, so the six different types of objects you can render. So here they have some logic, play a sound every second, and they're using the tick count. They're using the remainder, so they're dividing the tick count by 60, which would mean every 60 seconds they would play this song, or this ping. <laughs> You can draw, you can add like the transparency, you can also change rotation. Yeah, that's just, you can see already how powerful it is. We haven't even built anything yet. But this is just crazy. So what is this? This one they did, it almost built, it almost looks like they did like a starry night. So did some background music and then they render the background and stars. So, oh, this is what they do. So there's like some tricks you can kind of do. But if you see this, they're doing a map on 200 to generate 200 different stars. And they're just doing random number times grid, grid width, grid height. And then... <laughs> Yeah, random. I don't know what this was for. All the random. I guess it's just to basically spawn the stars in random locations. And maybe random sizes, too. Create a border to frame the game. So you can just say grid.left, grid.bottom plus one. And that would give you all of the, I guess, values. I don't even know what this would do. But that gets me to the point where to start developing the game, I'll show you what it would look like. So we can go to File Explorer, and what you get is when you download Dragon Ruby, you get a whole zip just like this. And somewhere around here, I had my old one. So what they suggest you to do is every time you create a new game, just take the zip and extract it and use that as your starting point. Now I'm guessing because it already has the code that it needs inside of it. Now this is the one that I already had created. I was trying to build like alien game, although I didn't really do anything on it. I was just using the stock uh, assets, but I can show you what I do have. So if I click on Dragon Ruby, this is what I built so far. So I have this dragon that I can fly around, and I have this guy that's following me. <laughs> this T-Pose dude. But if I shoot out some fire, I can actually make him blow up. And then it will respawn after a certain amount of time. This is all something that I built last night and got it to work. And I'm pretty happy with it. Obviously, we can make it more exciting. But just having something like this, I built this from scratch. Like, I built the fire, so it has to actually hit the guy to make him blow up. Just like that. And as you can see, the guy is trying to walk towards me. So I built in that logic, too, where it's kind of like... It knows your location, it's just following. One cool thing would be if I could flip around the dragon. Because right now if I want to shoot like that way, I have to basically... Like I wish I could flip around my dragon by pressing the arrow key. That would actually be cool. So that's that's this is what you get when you extract the thing. You get an executable already for your game. And then you have this folder called My Game, which is where you're supposed to put all of your code. So the main details are inside the app. We have this main Ruby file. So I'm going to open this up in VS Code. And we can see the code that I had for my simple dragon game. It's kind of a lot of code because I just, I never built a game with Dragon Ruby before. So like a lot of stuff I was just doing from scratch. Like here for if the... If I was doing an explosion, I have this full built out if statement, like if it's this and less than 20, and then I, I show the different states only for 10 frames each. And I had to do all of that just to play out the explosion animation. So there's some tricky things. And like right here, when I send out the fireball, I'm like sending the fireball, I'm moving it over, but I only show it for 15 frames. 
So that's how much time you have where it could like potentially hit the guy. It's pretty exciting. And then right here, this is where I'm spawning in the creature. So we're doing tick count, the remainder of 300, which means every five seconds. And it's going to spawn in for each creature, but it's going to return if there's already one spawned in. So it's not going to return, it's not going to spawn more than one creatures because I don't have support for that. If we had more than one creature right now, well, actually, it would just override the old one. You can see how I just have creatures like one. Now, if I wanted to move it to an array of creatures, that's probably what I would have to do to make it be multiple creatures. And then down here at the bottom is where we are actually moving. So we check if it's moving. Then I actually do this whole logic to detect if the creature Y is less than the dragon Y, then I'm going to increase it. And I have like this whole logic to basically make make the creature follow the dragon. So if I wanted to make the dragon turn around when I click to the left, it would almost be something like here. We already check if args input left. Well, actually what's happening is up at the top is where we're defining the original state of the dragon. And there is other, uh, if we go back into our code, go over to sprites misc we'll see that there's a few different states for dragons there's actually uh, six different pictures which we could use so if you wanted to make it look like your dragon was actually flying which i do you probably want to switch between these different animations so that's what a sprite is it's a few different pngs that are slightly different but it lets you add in realistic animations so if I did want to make my dragon fly its wings, how would we do that? <clears throat> so we have the base dragon right here. The only thing that we're changing is the X and the Y. So that's all of this code right here is just to move the dragon. And I'm sure there's a way to clean this up. I wonder if we could just move this into a method. Move dragon and then pass an args. And just define that way at the bottom. This is stuff that I haven't even tried yet. Like, can I actually move? Can I have this in a method so I can clean up my tick function? And then to rerun the code, I just have to come back into the folder and click on the Dragon Ruby application. Let's see if it works. Oh, it does still work. So you definitely can use methods, you can use classes. I already saw that in the documentation. <clears throat> so now let's try to handle, first of all, the animation so that we can see that the dragon is moving its wings. And from there we can handle orientation where I can have it turn to the left or the right. That'd be cool. So the way that we're gonna do this it's actually funny that I did my, I store my own count now that I'm thinking about it, but we have a kernel tick count, which is almost the same thing. It's counting up every time this tick runs, this tick function. So another way, instead of saying like the count starts at zero, and then if it's greater than 60, I'm going to like basically reset the state. I could also have saved the tick count and then like waited until a specific tick count to stop. That's another way. Anyways, for our system, for the dragon, what I want it to do is every 15 or so frames, switch animation, and then when it's at the last animation, it would reset. And see, that's the tricky part. It's just figuring out how we're gonna do that. So we could leave that path, and then down here we could do our condition. Might just be off the, the kernel take count though. Kernel take count. See, I can divide it by 15. And yeah, I mean, hold up. 
Or we could do the check. I guess that's actually not a bad idea. Because let's say let's have a count. Args.state.dragon <laughs> sprite slide equals zero. Right. Let's say we start it with zero. You can even do a check. If not, we'll set it to zero. And in the other case, if we do have the state, plus equal one, if not, if yes, so we can say if straight, if the sprite slide equals five already, then we'd switch back to one. Sprite slide equals one, or equals zero, actually. We kind of have this advanced logic in here. And then maybe I only want to have this run every 15 seconds or something. Or wait, not 15 seconds, every 15 frames. So kernel dot tick count divided by 15 frames equals zero. So I'm pretty sure we could do that. So this is going to run every 15 frames and it would hopefully change the position. And the last thing we do is at the very end of the if args.state.dragon dot path equals and we can update the path based on the number. Oops. So let's just interpolate right here. Arg.state.dragon sprite slide. That's what we call it. I don't know why I'm using uh, what's this called? Camel case. It just it looks with all this like this arg state it, it looks so much like javascript to me even though i know it's not javascript but we can refactor that in a second so let's click again oh, it's working it totally is working see my dragon's moving it's flapping its wings and i can shoot out fire it's actually crazy that was pretty easy I'm already so excited by this. This is kind of just what I've always wanted to do my whole life is make video games. Because I love playing them. So being able to do it in Ruby. I know I could do it in JavaScript too. And that's why it seems so similar to JavaScript. With like the whole tick count and everything. But I can say I'm really enjoying this. It makes a lot of sense. And I'm liking it. Alright, the next thing I want to do is change the orientation based off which direction I was flying. So let me real quick see how to do that. Dragon Ruby Sprite. So what I have to do is I have to take the sprite and I have to rotate it, I guess. Let me see the API and the output sprites. Anchors and rotation. So that's what we're looking for. Oh, we can say flip uh, vertically. <clears throat> so let's try to do that. What I would say is, um, actually on move dragon, which we put in the method now. So if left, what we'll do is we'll say args state dot dragon dot flip vertically equals true. And if it's right, then we're going to say false. And let's see how that looks. So if you run, <laughs> I'm going right. I'm going left. Wait. <laughs> no way. I think I used. Did I use flip? Flip vertically. I meant flip horizontally. That's funny. So actually, we need to change this. Because vertic vertical is, you know, like a phone screen. Horizontally. I have to remember how to spell this. I don't think I'm spelling it right. Horizontally. Whoops. There we go. So that is right. Now I'm just going to open up the code, click on our game. Boom, going one way. Yes, it works. Except for now, the, the, star, the star is flying out of my butt. That's kind of funny.
So now we have to choose which direction the star shoots based on the direction that I'm flying. But let's go ahead and do that. So really it's positioning based. Uh, if we find out where we're sending, right here is where I shoot the fireball. Right here, if arg is that state fireball, we're shooting it. And we're going to either add to the X or subtract. So what I would check is if, well, actually, the thing is, if we check the current state of the dragon, you might have been shooting a fireball, but then you turned, and I don't want it to, like, affect anything. Which means, which what that means is, right when we shoot, the fireball so right down here when i'm checking which actually i put that inside a move dragon it probably shouldn't be inside a move dragon since it's totally unrelated so let's put this right underneath which this is handling if you press the space button it shoots a fireball so if i come in here i can set another state you see every like this args dot state you could put anything there you could put numbers, you could put true, false. And that's one thing I realized, that's how you hold data through the tick. So you put it inside a state. And then you use or equal, which will, you know, it won't override the state. It'll actually just use, since the there's already state here on the dragon, it won't override it. It's really cool. You guys will understand more once you start developing your own games on here. Just try something, like try to do your first one, get it to say hello. It's so much fun. All right, anyways, when we do this, when we shoot fireball, we do show for it. I'm also going to say args dot shoot direction is either going to be left or right. So we'll check if args dot state dot dragon dot flip horizontally. So if it's true, the shoot direction would actually be left. I guess we can do it like that else args dot actually i'm trying to set it on on just args we have to say args dot state dot shoot direction since we're trying to store it in the state shoot direction equals left there are no equals right and then we'll make sure to end that out so now that we have this state sent we can now check for it down here when we're actually sending the fireball we can check if args dot state dot shoot direction equals right so if it's right we're just going to do the standard we're going to move it over to the right else we're going to do a minus equal now i think that should be good enough to handle that code so let's test it out so i'm flying around everything seems to be working yes i can shoot them that way i can shoot them this way and as you can see if i shoot one and then fly the other way it doesn't actually affect it like that's what i was worried about this is pretty sick this is already a fully working game the next thing I might add is just a score in the top right corner like points every time you blow up a new dude you can add it to the score and stuff like that and then also you can add lives like dragon lives so if a guy actually hits you then you might lose a life or lose a heart this is pretty exciting this is already such a cool game it's working just how I want it to I mean basically so now I want to try to add in the score so we can track how many of these creatures we have beaten. And I can put it at the top right corner. So that should actually be very easy. All we got to do is we can start by defining the score at the top arcs.state.score. And let's use or equal zero. Because like always, this tick method is going to run over and over again. So if we were to set zero, like if we set it to zero, then it would always override the old state. So that's like trick you have to be careful with. But if we do or equal, then we can set the default state. And what we'll do is we'll add to it later. So down, I guess we have to find all the way where you did like hit the creature right here. It's probably after, although we might actually we might want to update the score as soon as you hit the creature instead of after it blows up. But if we want to do it after it blows up, that's down here. And I guess let's do that. 
args.state.score plus equals one. And now to display the score on the page, you can really do this anywhere. We have to add a label. So args.outputs.labels. So that's the cool thing is there's, <clears throat> everything's off the args, but then there's different sections. Like state is for setting your state. Outputs is for rendering stuff on the page, like PNGs or boxes or lines. There's all these different things. And labels is how you add text. So to add my label to the page, I want to do X. I saw like this helpful feature that was args grid dot right. So if I wanted to, let's say, have it on the right and then at the top, we could say right plus one and Y args dot grid dot top plus one and then put the text we'll just do hello world for now no idea if this is gonna work well, actually i don't see it at all it should have already loaded in huh all right put the labels i probably need to fix that let's do x i want it at the end of the screen Let's just do 75 and height 600. Oh, and I was missing a comma. Honestly, I still don't see it. <laughs> oh wait, I said, cause I did height, I meant Y. Okay, now it works. So it usually works, uh, but I just, a lot of times I just have the wrong, <laughs> like literally the wrong value inside of it. So for X, Am I able to do args.grid.right? dot right? If I want to put it over on the right. No. It looks like that doesn't work. You check out the docs though. <laughs> See we have this grid right here that we can access. And you can actually get top returns value that represents the top of the grid. Oh, maybe I just want width instead of left or right or any of those. Yeah, that probably sounds like a more like if we got the grid width minus eight. <laughs> Where would it put that? See, I don't even see it. Oh, it's kind of there. It's like all the way down here. It's yeah. I think we have to minus actually the width of our word too so maybe like minus 100 minus 300 that might not actually be the best way to code it although when you resize it does kind of work <laughs> we could try something like this args.grid dot height let's do minus 100 Oh. Yeah, I mean, we could probably use this as where we put our score. 150. We could do this 50. Oh, wait, not 500. 50. It's right up there. And instead of text, you can have a string that says monsters killed. And then we could put in the amount. It could be args.state dot score finally and then we have to fix because i made the text longer let's give it 300 maybe 250 200 all right that's actually perfect so top right corner we have the amount of monsters killed now let's get to killing i'm gonna send my send my dude wait look at that one monster it's actually working so well that's probably my favorite part about coding with Dragon Ruby is just everything works. I've never been able to code a game like even this, even though this is simple, I've never been able to code something like this. The Dragon Ruby has made it possible. It looks beautiful. I just feel awesome with my dragon dude. Now, one cool thing would be probably if you know how in like Flappy Bird or those games, the screen actually moves and then there's obstacles coming in that you have to like move up or down to kind of get out, out of the way. 
I wonder how we can implement something like that. I wonder if my shoot distance should be farther. Right now we only let it go for 15 frames. I actually don't mind it because it, it just makes it so you can't like snipe all the way from the edge. <laughs> oh, also one thing is the spawn location of these dudes is not random. It's actually always the same. So I might want to fix that. If I look inside of here, this is where we're spawning it. Creature, we're spawning X, Y. So if I was to go random, like a random location, I don't even know how to do that. Random X and Y. X, Y. Position X, position Y. I'm just going to put these as variables for now, I guess. I don't know if it'll help me figure this out. Position Y. So what we do is, let's say there's a minimum position X and like a maximum. So like 100 through 1000. And then for the Y, I don't know how much the width is. It's less than 1280 though, so probably 720. Probably like 100 through 600. We need a random number between those. Which I think Dragon Ruby does have a random. Although I think it's just Ruby. <laughs> it's not actually a Dragon Ruby method. So I can look up like Ruby, get random number, and range. Alright, just as simple as that. Literally wrap rand around this and it should work. Potentially. So if we come back, let's get rid of this dude and let's see. Ah, uh, we get an error. Can't convert range to integer. Although right here it says that it would work A to B. But right here it's saying it can't use a range as an integer. Which is interesting. I wonder, does Dragon Ruby use a different version of Ruby? It's possible. What version of Ruby does Dragon Ruby use? We also have the Discord page, which is pretty helpful sometimes. I'm sure I could just look up like version in the chat. There's a lot of those actually. Random. Yeah, I have no idea. Now let me look up how do you return a random number between in two integers? Exactly. Oh, max minus min plus min. He says that was kind of obvious in hindsight. I still don't get it. He actually had to like do, he had to, he basically wrote a whole method to get ranges to work. That's crazy. But what they just said was pretty interesting. So is the, wait, I actually lost it. The max minus the min plus the min. Interesting. The thousand minus one hundred plus one hundred. See, that doesn't make any sense. Wait, but if you just pass in a number to random, it would probably already use something inside of that number, right? Ruby lands. 
That's what I'm guessing. Ran 10, random. Yeah, that is. You just pass in the number. So I was trying to get a, a number between a certain value. And that's why he said it seemed obvious. I get it now. So you minus because it's supposed to get one inside of the range and it can't be less than the min. So yeah, that would actually work. You can do this. Cool. No. Oh, it did spawn in, so I guess it is working. Let's see where the next one goes. It's up there. Yeah, the random spawn feature is working now. That's pretty cool. Oh, now we should add in actually if so if this guy does hit my dragon, that would kill my dragon, and we would subtract from the hearts. Which we don't have hearts up here right now. But we can add them in. Let me go back to my games. Let's see if we have any graphics for this. And by graphics I mean the sprites, the free sprites that they added in. Oh look, and they have a bunch of different monster colors. Eventually we could have different monsters that are maybe like certain monsters require more hits. Uh, they don't have hearts, although I could use probably I could just use one of these like hexagon or isometric. Let's do isometric red for heart. And we could put it up in the right corner. So to code that, we first have to set the amount of hearts. Say state hearts or equals three. So you start off with three hearts. And then what I'll do is I would say state hearts. I think I can loop over them like each do. I don't think I've done a loop like this though yet. Probably do each with index. Although I guess it's already a number, so I don't I don't even do index if it's already. Wait, I can't do a loop over it either because it's just a number. What am I saying? What you have to do is actually hearts dot times do and then like the number. So three times do we could add arch.outputs.sprites and we'll shovel in the isometric this is like sprite slash I need that path so slash isometric slash red dot png png and of course we need an x y and height width so x will be 10 y is going to be I want it at the top, so arg stock grid height minus 20. And for the height, we can just give it like 25 width 25. Passing the path. Oh, and this would do this for each one. So actually, the x, since we're doing it three times, let's just multiply by n. So 10 times n, which should space them out equally. Let's see. Oh, it actually did, except for. The distance they're spaced out. I mean, actually, I don't, I don't mind the stacking. That looks fine. So I might leave that, but I think the position I could fix. So instead of, like, I have to increase the x and the y just a little bit. Let's do minus fifty. Well, yeah, maybe we should have a. Like, I, I don't mind the stacking, is what I'm saying, but we almost need a base. So, like, we could do this, but also have, like, a good 50. Yeah, there we go. So, we push it off to the side. And if we even wanted to have a label, too, we go ahead and our style puts our labels. 
and just make sure that the X would be larger than these, so maybe like 100. The Y could be the same. Right, minus 50. And text is going to be parts. Oh, I guess it's a little bit too far down, so let's change it to 25. There we go. That's pretty good to me. So you got your hearts, and then you got your score over here. When we do shoot it, when monster's kill goes up, <clears throat> which actually I might need to level these out UI wise. Change that to negative 25 so it's on the same level. And we could also add in sound effects because right now I have my head headphones on and I don't hear anything. So having some sound effects would be cool. Like when you shoot the thing. Right now there's no sound effects. So we'd actually have to add in our own sound effects. Surprisingly, I have some sound effects on my machine. Although I, I might just want to get new ones. <laughs> right now I probably only have like Mario sound effects and stuff. <laughs> but a cool website for sound effects is called Sounds Resource. So Sounds-resource.com. It has all the sounds for all these classic games. So even that back to arcade. This might be something that I want to take the sounds from. It's like an old arcade game. Just for this type of game. Um, just look through. Maybe Bucky O'Hare. That might have good sound effects. You just click here on sound effects. It'll download the whole zip. Which is pretty tiny, and then we could look through that and see if there's any good sound effects we could use for our game. So let's extract. Go into the sound. So we even have voice, that's crazy. There is only one way to restore the <laughs> That's awesome. So yeah. I mean, honestly, any of those could work. How about we use that for the blow-up sound? So to drag it into our code, let's pull open like the folder with your app, and then go to the My Game folder, go to Sounds. That's where we'll drop our sound. So this one, I'm going to rename it to Explosion, or maybe just Explode. We can do that to so the sound for like if your dude dies, basically. It's taking so long. Let me rename or have a like. I guess just die. <laughs> I'm also looking for one, like, just for a little sound when you shoot the fireball. I guess that could probably be it, and I could always turn it down, too. Oh, why is it slow? Such a tiny file. Alright, wait, hold up. I'm renaming the wrong one. Call the shoot. So now to add in sound effects, that's a whole nother part in the docs. Although it should be very, very easy. So it's part of the outputs. At least I, th I thought it was part of the outputs. It looks like it's not part of the outputs. It might be just part of runtime. Or no, it's part of audio. Whoops. So you can actually turn down the volume. You can have one-time sounds. You can do it either way. You can say args audio this, or you could just directly use it off the outputs, which might be what I want to do. Now for one-time sound, that's probably all we need for our simple game. So to implement this, 
let's come back and let's go to the different sections so <laughs> first thing would could be when you shoot the fireball which would be oh, the method is actually right here shooting fireball just say arch output sounds shovel in the direct path which would be sound slash shoot now it's it's a wave I, I wasn't sure if it was a wave or mp3 but it's a wave so we do dot wav let's see if that works it does work although it's really loud so ideally that would be a lot quiet a lot quieter wonder how can i change the volume for one specific audio i think it would be it right here volume is right here is the gain so that's what we do go back to the code instead of just shoveling it into sounds we're going to do args audio fireball equals hash what was the method input i didn't have it right file path and then we're going to change the game to like 0 0.3 so it's really quiet and then actually when it would hit it would be the explosion sound which i'll also add in so that would be i think it's just right down here we actually would be hitting the target so we get added in the sounds explosion and make sure it has a different name Oh, explode. So I actually had the path wrong. So we weren't even getting a noise. It's supposed to be explode. You can't really tell, but there was two different sounds. I bet if I turn down the first one, we have gain 0 0.1, but I might even do like 0 0.05. Just a very light sound. A little like wind kind of sound. Then when you do hit, it makes the explosion noise. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. We could even turn up the explosion from 0.1 to like 0.3. Because the explosion could be a little bit louder. <laughs> yeah, that seems good. So now we can handle the hearts. So when this guy actually does come and step on my dragon, we could lose a heart. And then respawn the dragon somewhere else. We're actually checking right here if the fireball intersects the creature, then it hits the creature. We'd have another check, which would be if the creature is intersecting the dragon, which might actually happen here. This is the code that's having the creature move we could implement our check inside of here because we're already checking if there is a creature and we're adding the sprite for the creature and we're making a move we could also check if arch state creature intersect direct arch state dragon intersect direct has a question mark So if it does intersect, oh, I had the wrong name, creature. For right now, we could just put out a message. There's a really cool way that you can log, which you probably saw from the spawning message. So right here, you can call this notify method and actually show a message at the bottom of the screen. So let's say creature hit dragon. So yeah, as you can see, we're getting the message. 
and it would only be when the creature actually is on the same or like a close enough location i guess it's actually it's not really accurate because it gives like the intersection is actually a little bit off where it triggers it before it's actually hitting the dragon which is interesting but that also might make sense let's say if because the, the creature has long arms, so he could probably reach you at that point. Anyways, all we could do is just go back into the code for now. We could say args.state.hearts minus equals one. So we're going to lose one heart. We already lost all of our hearts, actually. But what should have happened is we respawn the character, respawn the dragon. So right now in the code, I think the easiest way to respawn the dragon, since, like I said, this happens every time, every time this whole code runs for every frame, every 60 seconds, or every 60 frames per second, which is kind of insane. But what that means is it's going to automatically redefine the dragon if we set it to nil. So down here, when it does intersect, if we just were to say arch state dragon equals nil, I th think that would almost just reset it. So see, watch what happens. Yeah, it automatically resets. And then we probably want to give that dragon a random spawn location, but right now it's fine. Now we have to handle, if there is no hearts, that would just be game over, and then there should be an option to restart. We could probably work on that. For right now, let's so let's exit out of the game. Let's relaunch and see what it looks like if we were to reopen the game. See, it's totally different. The hearts are back. The score has reset. So the state has all reset just by resetting the game. So that's cool. What I want to do is I almost want to add like a screen so you're not actually playing the game until you click start and i think to do something like that we would actually just take all of our code grab it and then we could actually just move it into a method say like play game args we make a whole method called play game i think that would work <laughs> and then we could have uh state or no args dot state dot is playing or equals false so we're going to set it to default but to false and then we'll check if it's playing we will have this play game true else we can just have a message so args dot outputs dot labels you can shovel in a message and i almost want to do it in the center of the screen I'm going to try to do args for x, args grid, width, divided by 2. And then for y, args grid height, divided by 2. And then text would just be start game. And I'll see what that looks like when we restart the game. Okay, cool. We do see the message. And it is kind of right in the center. Oh, that's weird. There's like an artifacting glitch when I was resizing the game. Wait, did it close out? It seemed like it quit the game when I resized. Something something was just glitching out. Yeah, it quit. That's weird. I wonder why. I wonder if it's because of this condition right here. Or if it's because of my play game thing. I don't know. Let's try to do, just do a fixed width for now. So X could be 400. Y could be 600. Or I guess half of X would be 1280 divided by 2. Be like 600. And then this could be 400. I just don't get why it was breaking the game. See, this actually looks better. 
but still when we resize, it's like, it just quits the game. Alright, so this is pretty exciting already. We have a simple game. I'm not going to worry too much about the resize glitch. I'm not sure what's happening there. But from here, I would like to, again, <laughs> with the resize glitch. But I would like to be able to start the game. So if I come back in the code, what we could do is we could say, like, click the click the space key to start the game. So we could add another label. Or maybe how about just click any key to start the game. And then we could do, well, let's make sure that these aren't overlapping. Let me decrease the Y. And now let's do if args dot inputs. And then we need to check, was there a key being pressed? Which we can check right here, if args keyboard, args dot inputs dot keyboard, uh, key down. We can say args dot state dot playing equals true, which means it should switch over to the play game state. Oh, and already, I guess the game was already going. And this guy has me corner blocked, so that's one because I don't have a spawn location. It, he just keeps like camping and killing me at spawn and making me go back. So that is a tricky thing. Let's close out of the game. Uh, let's find the spawn location, which is right um, here at the start of the play game. We have the X, Y. All we need to do is just take the code from where we spawn the creature. Where do we spawn the creature? Right here. On the kernel tick, we spawn creature based off the position X, position Y. But we could just do a similar thing. For our character it looks crazy but we could do that so it was 600 let's see let's see how that works we go back launch the game again you see that my dragon starts right here and we got our first creature so the game's on right now oh that was but then I <sighs> The thing is, if I walk into him, so why am I why am I at only one heart? And then when you're out of hearts, we'd have to stop the game, which right now we don't have a check for that. So we could just say, um. Yeah, when you run out of hearts, you just, it, the game would stop. I wonder, can you can you access the state outside? I think you would be able to, because then we could just check if args.states.hearts equal to zero. That's actually interesting. Where's the logic for the hearts? It's right down here, hearts minus equal one. We never have a check though, to make sure that it doesn't go below zero. Let me say if args.state.hearts equals zero, then we're just gonna return. We wouldn't wanna run that code if there's already zero hearts. Kind of the idea. We're getting error. Unexpected end of file. Huh. Oh, you can't do one liners. Return if. I guess they don't do that in Dragon Ruby. You can actually say return and then end. No, I think it's actually from something else. Saying on line 191. Man. Oh right, up there at the top. <laughs> yeah, one liner should be fine, right? Return if it's zero. 
up here at the top, I think I forgot on the if statement. So I was going to do the same thing. Well, actually, no. Up here, I'm going to have different logic. You just return if art state the hearts equals zero. You can just put on a message like game over. Click any key to restart the game. So it's very similar logic. So slightly different message. All right. That should do it. So this is started the game, although. The interesting thing is it. <laughs> In the tick, see it. Yeah, what I was expecting is it would go to the start game screen first. But for some reason with this logic, it's not. Args.state. The hearts equal zero. Maybe I should do a check first, like if this and state equals zero. Still, it, it just looks like for some reason they start the game with me spawned in, even though it shouldn't be. Let me comment out the hard start and see if it works. No, it's still spawning me in. Maybe I have to just explicitly set it to false. But then every time, can see now I can't override it should be starting but it's not if it's maybe i have to explicitly check is it playing click nope see that's weird i almost want to do that notification code it's a very helpful message that we can use for debugging and then we could just print out the state. Game is playing. Game is playing true. But it really shouldn't. <laughs> like, we're supposed to be starting it at false. That's the weirdest thing. It says it's true. Which kind of frustrating maybe I'll comment out that code to start the game I wonder if that's affecting it it is game is playing false click any key to start the game So it's almost like it just automatically detects a key down right away, which is not right. So let's say I think this check might actually be wrong. It, this probably doesn't return true or false like I was expecting. We need to actually specifically ask for a certain key. So we can say key down, but then we can say the key that we want. So in my case, I'll do space. I think that'll fix it. That's probably what was happening. Key down dot space. And then let's say instead of click any key, click the space bar to start the game. Cool. That's working. It would be cool to center the text, I guess. Could probably do that. Let me get rid of that notification. That's kind of annoying. So to center it, I'll probably just move the X back a little bit. 300, 300. Oh, not really centered, maybe 400. Somewhat getting there, and then this one would have to be like 500. Or maybe 550. Doesn't really matter to me that much. Okay, this is fine. So I click space and we're in the game.
spawning creature. I'll see. One weird thing is I just lost two hearts. And also now the game's... We should be out of hearts. Maybe I'll print out the heart count here for debugging. So inside of the hearts label, we can put hearts.state.hearts. Zero hearts. But see, we were supposed to be checking up here. Oh, I did the wrong check. Game over. Click spacebar to restart the game. So actually to restart, we would want to do a few things. Like probably reset most of the state. So let's say like dragon equals nil, args.state dot creature equals nil, args.state dot hearts equals nil. And the thing is when you set these to nil, the next time that we do trigger this function, it's going to do the or equal, and since it's gonna be nil, it's going to reset it to the original value. As long as we make sure to reset the states for all the things that are important. I think that was really it. So as long as we reset all of these, we should be able to restart the game. And then it's just as simple as saying args state dot is playing equals true. Cool. So now I'll press space. And we're back in here. Oh, except for the score. I guess I forgot to reset the score. Args dot state dot score equals nil. One heart left. He got me. Okay, game over. Which didn't we have a game over sound? We could get that playing. I think we did add it in. My game sounds. Yeah, die. Okay. I don't think we ever added that sound in. Why don't for now let's just play it at the end so we can say args audio game over. We have to put the path, which is going to be sound slash i.wave, and then we can put the gain 0 0.3 so it's not too loud. And that's actually all you need to play a game over sound. So now let's go back. All right, let's test out our game. Oh. So it actually spawned the monster right on top of me. Might be a check that I need to make sure it doesn't happen too often. Like there, again, it, it spawns so close to me. Oh, shoot, got me again. This is honestly such a fun game.